Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan, brief conversations with people I find fascinating. I am getting close to the end of my chats with Governor Moore's cabinet secretaries. And today my very special guest is Vincent Chiraldi, the Secretary of the Department of Juvenile Services. Secretary Chiraldi, thank you so much for taking time to talk today. Thanks for having me on. I look forward to kibitzing with you. Excellent. So there is so much to cover. So I'm going to try to cruise through. Uh, you grew up in Brooklyn, graduated from Binghamton, got a master's in social work at uh, at, uh, at, eh, at NYU. That's what I thought. Um, and you started this long and illustrious career um, in juvenile services. Talk to me about how you first got inspired by the by the field. Oh, sure. That's a great place to start. So, you know, when I was growing up, a lot of my friends got in trouble. It was a blue collar neighborhood and it was Rust Belt time. So a lot of the factories in my neighborhood, I had three factories on my block. Right. And all of them closed when I was a teenager. Uh, and so a lot of what was happening was mostly the men in the neighborhood were being thrown out of work. And so there was a lot of alcoholism and that, you know, filtered its way down to the to the kids, mostly the sons, who started then taking drugs and getting arrested by the cops. And so I grew up in an area where, you know, that wasn't happening to everybody, but it was happening enough. So uh, my eyes were awake to it. And then um, when I went to college, I went upstate, uh, Binghamton, which is a state university. And that was, for me, it was a totally new world. I, I was out of Brooklyn, which was, you know, Brooklyn in the early 80s was, there were a lot of problems, right? People were making movies about how bad New York was. So Binghamton was heaven as far as I was concerned. But when I had a chance to do internships, I started doing them at the juvenile justice system, which was called the New York State Division for Youth. Right. So I worked with caseworkers and I worked in a group home and I just fell in love with it. There's really no other way around it. I just enjoyed you know playing basketball with the kids taking them camping right. hearing their problems and just being there for them right um george bernard shaw the playwright wrote uh those who can do and those who can't teach you have had your career has been a fascinating back and forth between academia and policy making and then actually being in the trenches which do you like better and what have you learned um, in your policy work that you've applied uh, generally in your work in New York, in Massachusetts, in D.C.? So my mother, my brother and my sister were all teachers. And I used to throw that George Bernard Shaw quote at them on a fairly regular basis Seriously? Uh, as, as the only non-teacher in the uh, <laughs> in the family, me and my dad. Um, and uh, definitely doing Definitely doing. Yeah. You know, everyone's like, this is a hard job. And, you know, if the, the jobs are very, if you do them right, they're emotional. Yeah. Because you don't want to detach from the reality of what's going on with the kids. We are going to get to that. Yeah. And every once in a while, I needed a, I needed a respite from that. So going into academia for a couple of years was good. But yeah. I always found myself champing at the bit to get back into doing. Um, and I'm better at that than I am at studying and read there's a plenty of great researchers there's not a lot of people that want to get into the guts of government yes. and actually make it work it's kind of thankless when things go wrong everybody knows about it when things go well you kind of disappear right so, so um so i wanted to, i wanted to get back in there and that's that's where i that's where i love i love it so before we get into the into the nitty-gritty of of being the secretary Talk to me about the process. When did you first meet Wes Moore? What was the interview process like? What was it like getting the call? Give me a, give us an idea of how that all went down. I uh, I met Wes Moore when I was commissioner of probation under Mayor Bloomberg, and he was the head City. of the, in New York City, and he was the head of the Robin Hood Foundation, which yes. is a big anti-poverty foundation in New York City. Yep. And some of his people had seen what we were doing, heard about what we were doing. And okay. they asked me to come and brief their staff, including, you know, their boss. And sure. so we, you know, we hit it off right away. I think I only met him like once or twice in that role because we were both pretty damn busy. Sure. Um, 
But then when he got the job, you know, I, I raised my kids in Maryland. Yes. Right. So I lived here for like 15 years before I went back up to New York. And so I always kept an eye on Maryland. And my wife and I really loved it here. So we were going to move back anyway. And then when he got the uh, when he became governor, it was like, well, let me let me send my resume. I actually literally sent it through the portal. That's great. And then I got a call. I think it was from Johnny Dorsey or our our uh, Secretary Tisha Edwards. Edwards, who who, with his... whom I've kibitzed. Yes. Yep. Uh, yep. Yep. It's yep. Yep. Amazing. The then I, I interviewed with the two of them, and they had Patrick McCarthy, the president of the uh, uh, Annie Casey Foundation, was like a guest interviewer. Nice. Um, which it was really a great conversation. And the next conversation was a great conversation with the governor. Yes. And then they, I think it was like a, shortly after that, Johnny called me up and um, and I was like, yep, I'm on my way. That's fantastic. So, um, so this cabinet <clears throat> is filled with extraordinary people who are talented, experienced and all that, including yeah. you. Give an example or two of how you've worked across cabinet departments. Right. So early on, myself, Secretary Lopez from the Department of Human Services and with Secretary my kibitz. <laughs> yeah, and Secretary Scruggs. Have you kibitz with her? Not yet. She's uh, on the list. Okay, you got to get her. And uh, from the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, yes. we all got together and said, we share a ton of families and a ton of actual clients themselves. Some of them are, you know, in both or sometimes all three uh, jurisdictions. And we're not cooperating and collaborating as much as we should. So that was one part. Yes. But the other part was there's a lot of good research and increasing research on how uh, violence and crime are focused on certain neighborhoods. Mm. They're not ubiquitous. Even when you control for other factors, neighborhoods that are sort of less socially cohesive, that don't have as many kind of informal supports, be that coaches willing to run a basketball league or a minister willing to do yes. stuff on weekends with the kids, uh, that they do worse. Yes. So we said, how can we do both of these things at the same time? How can we collaborate so families don't have to go here, there, and everywhere when they're dealing with our three agencies? Yes. But how can we do it in places so that not only are we helping the family, but we're building that whole community up in a way that sometimes our agencies tear those communities down. Yes. And so we're trying to flip that script. I love it. So what did you inherit from the Hogan administration? What was the biggest challenge? What was the vacancy rate? What did you have to focus on right away? Yeah, so I mean, a vacancy rate for my frontline staff, my what we call RAs. Um, what does RA stand for? Um, residential assistant. Okay. So it's would be the equivalent of a correctional officer in a prison, right? But we don't want to call them that. So we call yes. them residential assistants. And we we try to train them to be not just turnkeys, but to be people who help children. Um, that vacancy rate was 18%, mm. right? So one out of five-ish. And now it's seven. So that's good. Nice. Um, that's impressive. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, can we do high fives on this? <laughs> like That's a big one for us. Love it. Um, and also that's burnout stuff because they're they're drafted. You have to stay. You can't leave if your replacement doesn't come. Yeah. And so what that means is when you come to work on a Sunday, you have to ask yourself, can I stay here for 16 hours? Right. And some of them are way out and, you know, far away. And so it's an hour and a half there. It's an hour and a half back. So think about this. You work a 16 hour shift. Yeah. You drive an hour and a half. You got to get back to work at the next shift that next day. And you're so, not getting paid a ton. And no. it's not a glory job that no. people admire and no, appreciate no, no. In the way they right. should. Some people look down on it in, in, yeah. in some respects. And so getting that down was huge. It was really huge to to get it down. We still got a ways to go. Yeah. Um, but the way things work on overtime is you can volunteer or you can get what's called drafted. And more and more people are volu like having volunteer. Mm. Uh, and they don't have to work. So mm -hmm. some people always want the extra money, so they'll volunteer. The best thing is for nobody to get drafted. Sure. For everybody who wants overtime to be volunteering for. Yeah. And yeah. there were a couple of days, one of my superintendents told me, there were a couple of days there was nobody on the draft list. And mm -hmm. that's big because you're worried about that. You have to think about that. When I go to work today, am I going to am I able to work 16 hours? And if you're not, some people call in sick and then it becomes, you know, kind of a vicious cycle. So we're hoping that we got a virtuous cycle now. Okay, well, congratulations. 
Uh, I have a lot of policy questions. So let's see if we can do these fairly quickly. Uh, the impact of mass supervision on race, one in 12 young black men. Talk about talk about the racial divide. Yeah, I mean, it's not just supervision, it's incarceration. We, Fair, we, yes. you know, we have a mass incarceration problem in America and we're nowhere near to solving it yet. And we, we that needs to be part of our calculus when we think about how to achieve safety. Yes. We need as a society, one of the things I love about working for Governor Moore, it's oh, it's never either or with the guy. It's always both end. Of course, we have to have public safety, but we also have to have decency. We also have to follow evidence to make places safer. And you know, we need to have racial equity yes. as we do what we do. Absolutely, the, the racial disparities in our system are horrible. Yes, we in Maryland, for example. Um, try more kids and imprison more kids as adults than all but four states. And 90% of those kids are black or Latino, 80% are black. So, one, so that's in conscience as far as I'm concerned. So one of your ideas has been to keep uh, people up to age 25 um, in with juveniles. Talk about that if you would briefly. Yeah. I mean, that was one of a zillion ideas in a paper. It's something that people have focused on because it seems so radical. But the real concept there was very, very clear evidence from the brain science that people's brains don't fully mature. Right. And you can see it in crime rates. It kind of gradually changes. The peak of violent crime amongst males, and that's where most of the violent crime is, is age 19. Hmm. It kind of gradually matures to 25, and then really kind of substantially goes down. Hmm. So... We know, we know from many other things, Senator, that people aren't ready at 20 to be adults, right? right? Because they can't buy a beer till they're 21. Right. They can stay on their parents' health insurance till they're 26. Try to rent a car as a 21-year-old male. Right. It's really hard, right? I've because, actually sponsored because... legislation on that, but it's hard to, it hasn't moved. And that's not because Hertz doesn't want their money. Right. It's because they're a bad bet. Yeah. And so all I'm saying is let's follow that science and have some gradual change so right. that at the age of 18, you're not suddenly yes. for all purposes an adult. Yes. Several countries have done this. Vermont has just done it. Now it's 18 and 19 year olds are in the juvenile system in Vermont, unless they do something really bad, in which case they go to the adult system. Right. And I think that's a system that actually cares for this later adolescence better and more successfully than the adult system. And that's that's what that was about. Uh, talk about gun control, gun reform, gun safety, whatever it is you call it. How big a problem with young people? And is there an answer, something that you advocate for? Yeah, it's interesting. You look at crime rates between the United States and other countries, and one study I'm very familiar compared New York City to London and compared Los Angeles to Sydney, roughly. Sydney, size. Australia. Yeah, uh, actually, Melbourne, it might have been. Okay. Similar sized cities. And um, on almost every category of crime, we were similar. We steal about as many cars as each other, we break into as many apartments, you know, but gun crime. New York was several times higher than London and L.A. was several times higher than Sydney or Melbourne. So what's the answer? Well, I mean, I think part you have of the a magic wand. Is, <laughs> well, I mean, part of the answer is we need to be more as serious as we can legally be about controlling guns. Right. Mm -hmm. But part of the other answer is I got these kids today and the laws, as much as I think the governor and many in the legislature would like to. Uh, restrict guns. It, it doesn't seem like the Supreme Court's going to let that happen. So what we do, and there's good evidence behind this, is you focus on the kids most likely to be engaged in gun violence, either as victims or offenders. Mm. And by the way, the data is same on both, right? Yes. Pretty similar. Yeah. And you tell them that this is serious and that serious things can and will happen to them if they get caught involved in gun violence. But that's not good enough. You can't just give these kids a stern lecture yes. and hope that the world is solved. Yes. And so then we put uh, serious resources into them. We give them a life coach that's walked in their shoes from their neighborhood and it's what we call a suitcase for success. Mm. And that involves, we can we can get you in college or a vocational training. Yes. We can get you a stipended uh, apprenticeship or a job. 
We can move your family if they're in danger right now. And we're going to take you to ball games and camping and canoeing. So you can see there are other ways of having fun right. and being excited that so, are pro-social. And that we yeah. call the Thrive Academy. And we're going to have that researched by the University of Pennsylvania, which researches these kinds of programs nationally. And we're going to publish that. That's great. Uh, so someone watching this or listening to it, um, believe that crime is on the increase, that it's scary out there, the streets aren't safe, I'm going to get carjacked, I'm going to get shot, or or um, my children are going to get hurt. Talk about the, the current statistics and why you think people shouldn't be so scared. Maryland isn't that scary a place. You know, I'm going to say it's, I have mixed next things to say about crime. I mean, it's not up as much as people thought, but it also started at a pretty bad level. So I mean, yes. America has a terrible gun violence problem. And I don't mean to trivialize that. I, I honor people's concerns about that. I share those concerns. That said, it's way better than it was 10 years ago, five years ago, especially in terms of kids. The number of kids we get referred to us has gone down a lot. The two areas of deep concern that we need to put resources into and put our brains into is car thefts and gun crime. Yes. And I'm pushing on gun crime, and you're going to hear more about car thefts this year. I haven't quite figured it out, but I'm talking to the cops and the prosecutors and the communities about how to, how to sort of change that scenario as well. So you just referenced the cops. Uh, one of the stupidest phrases I've ever heard in my political life is defund the police. Uh, say just a couple of sentences about that, because I have a lot more questions. You know, I think that there's some room for a conversation about what um, what the police do and don't do. Right. We ask too much of them. We ask them to cure mental illness. We mm -hmm. ask them to, you know, not not engage in conflictual behavior, but we want to make sure that somebody with a broken tail light gets pulled over. At some point, we got to say, what are our priorities here? Because when the police engage in too much stuff, then they, you know, you can't spread the butter too thin, mm -hmm. right? If everything's an emergency, then nothing's an emergency. Mm -hmm. I think we want the police focused on the more serious stuff. That's my own personal opinion. And if that's what those ill-advised concepts of defund the police was, then I'm you know, I understand that, yeah, maybe there should be some prioritization. Maybe a social worker should deal with some of the people who are mentally ill and not a cop, especially right. if the less dangerous ones. Right. That I can have a conversation about. Getting rid of police, I mean, that's a non-starter with anybody. Right. So all of the programs that you run and oversee um, are expensive. And Maryland is the fifth highest, spends more than uh, almost any other state on juvenile services. So over $1,100 per child per day for a total of $414,929 per year. That is a ton. So how do you justify that? Where can cuts be made? Or is it paying off? No, I, I don't think it's paying off. I don't think we're getting our bank for a buck. And I don't justify it. Um, I think that one thing I've seen, a couple of different places to sort of focus on. One is we have too many levels of supervision here. Mm -hmm. There were, when I arrived, eight levels of supervisors between me and a frontline staff in one of my facilities, mm -hmm. eight different levels, different jobs, and seven between me and a probation officer. Mm -hmm. We've already chopped- And let alone the, the youth. Yeah, I'm one more for the kid, right? Right. And so we've 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 chopped a couple of those. I think we need to do more of that. I, we mm. have supervisors, supervising, supervisors, supervising, supervisors, and that's really it's a waste. It's a tragic waste of money, especially when we need it for the kids in the community. We can Absolutely. put it into programs, right? So some um, of the people who have proven effective with the kids maybe can move into some management roles or move up in some ways and. Yeah, or we can turn some of those vacancies into contracts rather than yes. just filling the vacancies. If mm -hmm. we don't need, we have to look at whether we need the vacancy before we say, let's rush to fill it. Right. And I'm having those conversations at the, at the yeah, at my, with my bosses to try to figure out how to do that. The, the other thing is sometimes we put kids in custody because we don't have the kinds of robust services in the community for them. And some of those kids, I think everybody would agree. If you've got a good program for this girl, 
We don't think she's going to reoffend. She just keeps running away from home and mm. engaging in dangerous, you know, behavior that we're afraid for her. And sure. sometimes I get kids locked up, not because they're afraid of them, but because they're afraid for them. For them. Wow. And, and that's tragic. Like, that's the best we can do in Maryland in the year 2024. So, you know, some of those... We need to figure out a way to move those resources so that they follow the kids into the community. We can't just dump them into the, you know, into the river. We yeah. have to make sure that those kids are taken care of when they go home. Otherwise, we're going to have to take them out of those homes. Sure. So speaking of protecting the kids, Maryland, there are only two states worse than Maryland at protecting the rights of kids, according to something I read, Alabama and Mississippi. And I hate when Maryland is compared to Alabama and Mississippi. So Talk about how we protect the rights of juveniles. And is there one thing that you would suggest that we need to do differently? You know, the, the, I think that one of the problems we have is we automatically try a lot of kids as adults. And these were a whole raft of these laws got passed in the 90s when we were calling kids super predators and the mm -hmm. crime rates were really high. And a lot of legislatures, including ours, passed laws that tried more kids as adults automatically. And that most of those states have undone that. I actually don't know why Maryland has not. But every year for the last 13 years prior to this session, there was a law to undo that. I think we need to pass that law. I think judges actually can make these decisions. I don't think you legislators or actually your predecessors from 1990 need to make that decision for today's judges. Okay. Most of the kids that automatically get tried as adults never end up in an adult facility. 87% of them have their cases dismissed, get probation, get sent back to my system, but they wait for four to six months, sometimes in an adult jail. You know what happens to a kid for four to six months in an adult jail? You know what they're learning in there? They're yeah. learning how to be an adult offender. Mm -hmm. And so if we're gonna, if we are not, if they're not gonna end up in the deep end of the system, they should never visit the deep end of the system. We should start providing them services right away. Right. And that would save us um, tens of millions of dollars. And if I save that money, I'm putting it right into programs in the community. Nice. How big a problem is addiction? What percentage of the youth when they arrive in your programs do you think are addicted? So this is a kind of crazy problem that we have right now because as addiction and overdose deaths were climbing, and my kids went to Blair High School mm -hmm. in Montgomery County. Great they are training kids in Blair High School how to use Narcan yes. to save the lives of other kids, right? We're debating right now a bill to make it a really widely available without yeah. training. Yeah. Mm. And so that's, I mean, what a sign that is. And mm -hmm. as that was happening, Maryland was cutting drug treatment programs, not even mine. They were cutting them from the Department of Health. There's mm -hmm. no residential drug treatment program in Maryland for kids. Mm -hmm. I pass a close on the way to Victor Cullen, which is our one yeah. A hardware secure facility for kids in Maryland. 20 feet from the front door is a closed residential drug treatment program. Mm -hmm. So you know what's happening? The kids that used to go to that one, they go to that one. Mm -hmm. They go to the to the locked facility. We provide some level of uh, drug awareness training and some level of drug therapy, but it's not a drug treatment program sure. because a whole bunch of kids in it don't have drug problems. So they're not getting... Uh, so uh, I know that uh, Secretary Herrera Scott is going to be in the Department of Health with whom I've Department of Health, that's right. <laughs> is going to be increasing both in community services, which is important, as well as residential drug treatment program. But you got to kibbutz with her about that. There you go. All right. I have a lot more questions, but we need to start wrapping up. Um, education in jails. What are you doing that's interesting? Uh, it, I would say it's improved greatly since you gave us the opportunity to actually have a separate system ourselves called the Juvenile Services Education Program, yes. which I'll now call JSEP. Okay. Uh, but I gave you the acronym first. There you go. That works. Um, and I think the big, the big challenge for us is what we still need to improve some JSEP services, no question. Yes. But also, how, what's the handoff like coming out? Yes. And that how is, long, I think that's how. How long do young people stay with you? What's the shortest and what's the longest period of time? Uh, I mean, the ones that go to detention, which is just pre-filed, they can literally be in overnight. Okay. Um, but mostly in our committed facilities, which is where you go after you're convicted, if you will, sure. uh, it's about six months. Okay. Uh, and so you can do some good in six months, 
but I think I think our systems, I think we need a special thing for, for this group of kids. The um, uh, t- only 25% of kids coming out of juvenile correctional facilities nationally get a high school diploma or GED by the time they're 25 years old. Mm. So we as a system in the whole country stink at this. Mm. And we need to actually say this group of kids will not have a traditional experience by and large with education. What is the bespoke approach? I think that will involve some level of project-based learning, some level of kids getting GEDs, and some level of vocational training and apprenticeships right away because if these kids feel like work is is three years off they're going to hustle they have to they're too poor to to defer that gratification for two or three years some even for a year so that what you will hear more about that when we kibbutz kibbutz not kibbutz (laughs) kibbutz next (laughs) year you'll be hearing a lot more about that all right. GED, I think most folks would know, is a general educational development. It's the high school diploma alternative. Uh, tell me one program that you've established that you're especially excited about. It's the Thrive Academy, Barna. Okay. That'll be 20% of our kids, most at risk of gun violence. And I really do think we're going to reduce it. We're never going to eliminate it. And you will one day, no doubt, hear that one of those kids did something bad. Right. But I think we're really going to bend the curve on that. But so far, so good. I mean, the numbers are, it's new, but still, yeah, good for you. Um, other than that, any quick proudest achievements so far? Uh, I mean, I think the uh, the kids were all sitting around playing spades and watching TV in the facilities uh, after school was over. Now there's a raft of after school programs that are like your kids' after school programs, robotics, chess club, basketball, Amazing. all sorts of things. We'll expand those even more, but the fact that we laid that down within the first six months of being here was pretty cool. You could see nothing good happens when kids are just doing nothing. Are bored, right. Yeah. And we are totally gonna see if we can bring Scrabble up there. So Absolutely. Yeah, bring in that. Um, so everything you do and you've referenced it is controversial and hard and you are on the front line and the bullseye kind of on your forehead. How do you deal with the stress and the criticism? So the biggest thing for me is the governor's got my back, right? And he said that over and over again. If you don't have that, you're toast. It's over. Uh, if if all you are is risk averse, yes. and you're always double clutching, you'll just run the same crappy juvenile system that kids always get. You have to break some eggs and you know that when you're breaking those eggs, the big guy's got your back. And so for me, that takes care of it. Really, I've gotten a beaten for many years during my career. This is yeah. actually kind of par for the course. Yeah. Because whenever you fight the status quo, the status quo fights back. Yeah. And so that's typical. What's what's extraordinary is Governor Moore's support because he truly cares both about public safety and the kids. And he can hold both of those things in his head at the same time. That's how I deal with it. Plus, I got I got a slinky. You know, <laughs> what a great way to wrap this up. Um, that's brilliant. Um, I mean, a slinky or the Governor Moore thing? Uh, yeah, the, <laughs> let's say both. Uh, <laughs> Governor Vinny Schiraldi, uh, the Department of Juvenile, Juvenile Services. It is time for the Fast Five. Five quick questions, five quick answers. First, you have a really hard job. What is something that makes you laugh? Oh, my 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 wife and my in-laws who live with me. They're they're beautiful. I love it. Uh, question two. What is uh, a favorite family vacation? You've got a wife and two kids. And, Lake Placid, and the in-laws. Yeah. Lake Placid in the Adirondacks. That's our happy place. We go there all the time. Love it. Question three. What did you want to be when you were growing up before you got into this? I actually, when I was in high school, yeah, I went to a Catholic high school. It was a very kind of religious family. I always wanted to be a social worker, and that's what I am. Yeah. Fantastic. Question four, what's the best advice you've ever gotten from a mentor? Oh, um, when you're done with this job, be able to look yourself in the mirror. Fantastic. I love that. And question number five, Secretary Schiraldi, the Department of Juvenile Services, what is your hidden secret superpower? 
<laughs> what's the skill or talent you have that most folks can't do? So if you asked my children this, they've already figured this one out. They say, if I was a superhero, my superpower would be sleep. <laughs> I can fall asleep on a dime. I, before the plane takes off, I'm sleeping. When I my head hits the pillow, I'm sleeping. And so it's partly a joke, but restoring that battery, uh, I think, allows me to come to work and tilt at windmills uh, every day. I'm envious, I have to say, having been up at three in the morning, having sleep not in the near future. Yeah, that was good for you. Well, Secretary Schiraldi, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do to help our young people who are in crisis and who need to be diverted towards success. And uh, and thank you also for taking the time today to, to chat. Thank appreciate you, Senator Kagan. This was a lovely conversation. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you soon. Be well. See you. Thank you now. Take care.